Thank you, Hannah, and thank you for Hannah and the team's sterling work during the day. Once more, unto the breach, dear friends. This is the third Tremi final. Who has been with us since the very beginning, way back at 10 o'clock this morning? Oh, you are hardy souls. Whether Thomas Hardy or Oliver Hardy, it's hard to say, but well done. Can we have a round of applause from the rest of the audience for the ones who've been here since 10 o'clock this morning? Right, you have passed the parabola stamina test. I'm not quite sure I'm going to pass it. My voice is beginning to go. So if I start croaking and shouting strepsils, strepsils, please somebody come to my rescue. Okay, who was at one of the previous two? Oh, okay, yeah, a few. Okay, you kind of ducked out for a while. We know how it is. And who's new to all this? Who's, who's the first time they're here? And also, you've never been to a fame lab. You don't really know what the heck it is. All right, it's good to have new blood. Welcome to our... Science Communication Congregation, thank you, great to have you here. So I should probably explain, uh, you have stumbled upon the world's largest and most beautifully hosted science communication competition. Uh, it has been running in one form or another for 12 years, but for 10 years there has been an international version. It has slowly spread out like a kind of benign virus, con contaminating country after country, <laughs> and is now in every continent across the planet, well, bar one. Uh, which we won't go into, and, uh, it's on, uh, and there are 31 countries taking part in this year's final. Now, 31 is rather too many to squeeze into one final, so what we have are these three Tremi finals. And the good news is, in my opinion, they're just as good as the final, but they're free. So you've made the correct choice in coming along today as well. So far today, Fame Lab champions from Australia, Hong Kong, India, Malta, Mauritius, and Uganda have all been sent through to tomorrow night's final. It's the ultimate science smackdown. And now we're going to pick three more to join them. But making it slightly harder, maths fans, is that there are 11 in this Tremi final, whereas there were 10 in the previous ones. So that gives them slightly longer odds. The good news is that although this is a nasty business trying to whittle to winnow to weed them down from 11 to 3, it is not our job. It falls upon our three judges, people who have the infinite capacity for, for sagacity and the zero fear of wielding an axe. They have to do the deed, so can we please give them some applause as we bring them on? First, engineer, performer, trainer, event host, an Irish woman, Dr. Neve Shaw. Wildlife expert, zoology correspondent, author, writer, broadcaster, and amphibian rights activist, Jules Howard. <laughs> and former student of computing and cognitive science, turned founder of communications consultancy firm and organizer of all sorts of things in Italy, including particularly FameLab Italy, Mattia Crivellini. <laughs> so... Neve, as you get yourself seated. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> don't, don't say sorry. You're a judge. You'd be it's, assertive. It's a default. We're it's Irish. a default. It's really, we're really, really I'm half Irish. We'd We'd love to apologise. <laughs> well, it's marvellous. Well, OK, I'm sorry for you saying sorry. No, let's not um, Just remind us, there are key criteria, three key criteria yes. you're using to judge. There are, yes. What are they? So the three the key criteria, um, content, um, exactly what you're talking about, how clearly it's actually communicated, and then that certain oh, no, no, no. clarity. Clarity, that was it, yeah. And then that certain je ne sais quoi, which ah. is, of course, charisma. So the three C's, content, clarity, and charisma. Right, and Mattia, as well as that, of course, what's going to make a big difference? These are all winners, these are all champions. It's going to be your two minutes of questions. So yeah. how will you, do you know what kind of things you're going to ask? Can you give them any advance warning? Uh, we try to understand the people behind the science and behind the presentation. So enjoy your presentation and uh, we will fight with us. Yeah. Can I give you a top tip, by the way? You're rocking on that chair and you're only, if you only start going back a foot <laughs> or so, we could have an, a hilarious comedy moment here. Okay, thank you. I, will <laughs> I just, you know, I value your long term contribution to this final as well. Uh, and, and Jules, <laughs> last year, one of our Tremi finalists gave this brilliantly entertaining talk called Fifty Shades of the Epigenome. They okay. dressed up as a bondage queen in full outfit. They had a whip. They were fantastically entertaining, but the judges didn't send them through to the final because they weren't 
sure about they got all their facts Are you about right. to ask my opinion on whips and chains? No, 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 okay, no, no, fine, no, no. That comes later. That's fine. No. <laughs> no, what I meant was that, I mean, where do you get the balance between thinking this would be a potential winner of FameLab versus this would be a good person for the... You know, how do you get that balance right when you're choosing? I think, for me, uh, uh, you know, the clues in the word science communication, you know, we're talking about... Uh, exploring realms of, un, you know, un, the unknown, I suppose, and trying to um, discover stuff. So for me, you know, the whips and chains, you know, if you want to know my opinion on that, maybe we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but if it's taking away from the point of this, which is about science communication, for me, it strays into negative territory, if that makes sense. Right, and then finally, you've, unlike the other two, you've drawn the long straw. You have to pick three from 11, yeah. not three from 10. Does that make it easier because there's more to choose from? or harder because there's more to eliminate? That's a really good question, Quentin. I, I guess we'll, we'll know, but I, I, think, I think it's going to be harder, you know, because then there's more choice. You know, it's always the bigger the number, the more we have to deliberate. And as you say, if the quality has been so good so far, it just makes our job all the harder. Okay, but so better for the people here. Oh, better for the answer. people here, yeah, more of the merrier. So, okay, so rejecting 72.72727272% 72 <laughs> of them is a really, really, really <laughs> tough job. So can we give our, our judges some applause for the task ahead? <laughs> right, I think we've kind of covered a little bit of the history, the vague idea of the rules. The rest of it you'll kind of pick up as we go along. So we are good to go. So one, two things you need to know. One, anything that doesn't make sense now, it'll do in about five minutes' time. And two, this is Fame Lab, not Fame Library. Help encourage our judges by making some noise when you've enjoyed somebody. Cheer, boo, clap, applaud, whatever you want to do, but make some noise. Can we have a little practice? <laughs> Pretty good. Nice selection of noises. Right, let's bring on the first of our 11. In the last Tremi final, uh, we had the winner from Mauritius, one of the people who's going to be going through to a final. And when she was in her final in Mauritius, uh, the chair of the judges, no pressure here, judges, by the way, uh, was Her Excellency Dr. Amina Gurib Fakim, the president of Mauritius, the actual president. Now, we can't quite match that here, but we can come pretty close. In Spain, they have a tradition of the Spanish queen and sometimes the Spanish king attending Fame Lab. And Queen Leticia was there again at the final this year to congratulate the Spanish winner, Pedro Pajares. So he's effectively here by royal appointment. <laughs> Uh, Pedro is a math student at the University of Extremadura in Western Spain. Maths, no, is not the sum total of his knowledge. Uh, like many mathematicians, Pedro is fond of magic, but he's also fond, he says, of learning about almost anything. And in spare time, he uses to enrol in all sorts of different courses. I suppose you could say taking part in FameLab is a bit like going on a course, and this next bit is the exam. He gets extra credit for going first, and I hope some extra applause, please, for our FameLab Spain 2017 winner, Pedro Pajares. <laughs> this morning, I didn't comb my hair, which is nothing new because I never comb my hair. Combing hair is quite complex, and this is not because of a genetic issue, but because of a mathematical one. Blame a topology theorem. Topology is concerned about the property of space that are preserved and the continuous deformation, such as stretching or bending, but not breaking or, or breaking. <laughs> Topology allows us, to, allows us to presume that two objects are the same if when we deform one, we get the form of the other. For example, a cat and a ball can be the same. If we inflate, if we inflate the cat and inflate it, and inflate it, um, don't do it at home, because it will make a stain. <laughs> if I inflate it enough, it will become a sphere. But a donut and a ball can never be the same, the same, the same. <laughs> because I, I'm sorry, <laughs> because I cannot, um, I cannot cover the donut hole or punch the ball. So uh, now I'm going to introduce the Hairy Ball Theorem. This is a topology theorem who said that there is no non-vanishing continuous vector, <coughs> vector fields in even dimensional n spheres. Let me explain. Imagine a hairy ball. Any idea? For example, a coconut. Let's comb it. We start combing the hair, the vectors, from the top, from up to down, to a point in the southwest, we find a stiff hair turned down 
and we need to convert. But if I do that, the nearby hairs will have to change position. And now the, the, the hair is on top. May I could cut it, cut it, but if I do that, I will create a bald spot. It doesn't matter how many times I comb myself. It will always a hair stiff or a hair swell. So <coughs> this theorem has very interesting applications. For example, this is the Hurricane Hugo in 1989. And this is my cousin Hugo, <laughs> 2010. You can appreciate they are very similar. <coughs> and they will provoke the same effect. The Earth is similar to a sphere. It's not hairy like my cousin, but it has best of feel, such as wind. So according to the hairy ball theorem, there's always a point in the, in the Earth with no wind, with no wind. And this point will be the eye of the storm. So now you know that for the, very same, for the very same reason, it will be always a hurricane on Earth, I never be able to comb my hair. Thank you so much. Um, Thank Pe you. Pedro, how did you, um, why did you pick this particular uh, topic to talk to us about today? Because I think the, only the, number, the, <laughs> the name of the theorem, the yeah. Heribold theorem, I think it sounds well. So it's good, it's good interesting for people who maybe don't know um, too much about mathematics. Yeah. And it could be, an, a, be a way to explore it. So it was the beginning. Good. So is, this is a new theorem? Or is this someone else's theorem? This is your theorem? No, no, it's not my theorem. This is the real it's name real. of the theorem. Oh. Yes, but it's not my theorem. I, and, I how wish. <laughs> and how else can it be applied? Where else could it be applied? Yes, you can apply in meteorology. You can do, with this theorem, you know, there always a hurricane in some part of the world, at least one. There will be more, yeah. this theorem said, one or more, because this is an existing theorem, not a unity theorem. And you can apply, for example, in, in video games, in informatics, when you are when you are working with a three-dimensional space, you know you will never have a vector which uh, is, is different from zero in 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 all the surface. And uh, how topology can help in my life, like maybe with my strings or your sorry, my the topology. Topology. Yeah, how can help? Uh, I don't know the the sub. Um, well, topology is about the formation of yeah. surface, but it's about, uh, for example, if I want to work with a strange surface, I will go to another um, easier sur surface, and the properties are the same. So I will, instead of my head or the hurricane, I will work with a coconut, for example. Okay. Okay, tropical, yeah. topical, topological, <laughs> and logical, please make time to make our Spanish Spanish. Thank you. Pedro Pajares. So, cat inflation and hairy balls. It's a good job we're after the four o'clock watershed. Uh, second up is the reigning champion from Thailand, Parinya Kinnongjok. Parinya is in the fifth year of a pharmacy course at Konkan University and is interested in clinical pharmacokinetics. That's the study of how drugs move through the body and are absorbed within it. He says, as a perception, health, service, health science students are nerds, but they're not. Parinya believes that although people think dealing with medicine's difficult, he's very friendly with great interpersonal skills, and he wants to be the one who can help people to understand more about science, especially in the pharmaceutical field. He clearly was the one in Thailand, so can he be the one here? Brace yourself for a three-minute dose of Parinya Kinnongjok. <laughs> experience that sometimes you and your friend took the same medicine but respond to the same medicine differently. So what makes the same medicine work well in one patient but not the others? And is it possible to make medicine work for every patient then? The first questions can be answered easily because scientists have found out what makes the result of using medicine vary among patients. One of the reasons behind is down to the levels of genes. Because of human genes involved with almost every process of the interaction between drug and human body. So 
If there are some other genetic variation happen inside the genes, the result of using medicine will be changed. So the question is, how can we make medicine work for every patient then? Uh, these questions had challenged a scientist for a long time with the hope that one day in the future, this mystery will be unpacked. And now, the future has arrived. The solution is personalized medicine. But wait, what is personalized medicine actually? Let me tell you this way. Imagine when you need a suit that fits you. You will go right to the tailor shops, and then the tailor will use the measurement tape to measure your body and design the suit that fit you. Similar to the concept of personalized medicine, the doctor will use patient genetic information to design the treatment that fit for the patient. For example, if the patient needs to use drug A, but the result of the genetic test shows that the genes that involve the process of taking drug A out of the body does not function well. The doctor would then reduce the dose of drug A, or sometimes even change to be drug B, in order to prevent the toxicity that might occur. That is all for the concept of personalized medicine. In conclusion, I would like to say that personalized medicine, which used to be the future home, is now knocking at your door. And as there are two signs of every coin, so the practical and ethical regulation need to be established in order to ensure that the utilization of personalized medicine is based on fairness and to, uh, to prevent the illegal use of patient genetic information. If not, the healthy future will turn to be the scary one. Thank you. Should be a near future, we talk about, about a few years or maybe 10 years, we can be really in our life, this situation. Uh, for now, right? Yeah. I think for now, there are some of uh, many places in the world that are, they are working on it now. And there are some of them that, that has been used. For now, the applications that we use this kind of process, we, we can use it for diagnosis. We can use to uh, predict the effect of drug in, in the real life. And we can also use it to prevent the toxicity of medicine, uh, the toxicity or the side effect of medicine that might occur. So for now, they are, can be used in the real, real situation, but not wi widely used for now. And for example, in America, they, they raised up the, the campaign called the Precision Medicine, but the, the most of the concept is almost the same. And as you, on, a, on a personal level, um, what is it about communicating this kind of science you like? Is it, is it the medical helping people, or is it the joy of communicating science? Uh, for me, myself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I think both of them. I, I, I can do the communication for helping people and also for making people understand more about uh, some kind of medicines and working with uh, healthcare problem and uh, raise up some awareness to take care of themselves, something like that. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank Good you job. very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Judges, a gentle reminder, you have two minutes for questions, not one minute 20. Right, okay, everybody gets two minutes, okay? So, that was great. Now, in at number three from Germany, we have by some distance the Tremi finalist with the shortest name, Olga Sin, seven letters. That's only marginally more than the countries that she's lived in, having been born in Macau, then relocated to Portugal, where she did a degree, got a PhD in the Netherlands, and now relocated again to the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biomedicine in Munster in Germany, where she's a postdoc researcher. Olga says she's always been interested in the cellular and molecular mechanisms that drive neurodegenerative diseases, which must have made her an unusual child, and is now looking at how protein homeostasis goes awry in such diseases and the influence of what we used to call junk DNA on this process. Olga's Twitter bio calls her a scientist, learning German, and keeping up with the world. But for the next three minutes, she's trying to keep up with the world in English. So a big helical welcome to our non-German Germany winner, Olga Sin. <laughs> or buildings that send people to outer space. And yet, we fail to remember where we put our keys 
or where was it that we were going to buy when we arrived to the grocery store? Scientists yearn to understand how the brain changes during aging and why aging is a major risk factor for developing neurological diseases. I study how proteins are made. And we think of proteins as nutrients in our food or as components of our muscles, but they're vital for our brain, too. Imagine this is a protein that has just been synthesized. In this form, it's pretty useless, so it needs to acquire a three-dimensional shape, and it needs to fold in a specific way, like this, to become functional. This could be hemoglobin that nourishes your brain with oxygen, or it could have a, pro a structural function, providing rigidity and stiffness to your neurons. Now, sometimes these proteins misfold, and they adopt alternative shapes like this. Now, if the cell, or especially your neuron, cannot fix this, then you're in big trouble. And now it's time to talk about zombies. Imagine there's a zombie apocalypse in this room. There's chaos everywhere, and you're inevitably bitten by a zombie. And when you get bitten by a zombie, three things will happen to you. First, you're going to lose your purpose of life. Second, you're going to bite other healthy human beings and turn them into zombies, too. And finally, you'll all stick together to the zombie horde and wander around endlessly. Misfolded proteins act like zombies. Once they misfold, they cannot function anymore. And whenever they encounter a healthy protein, they make that protein misfold as well. And in the end, they clump together as protein aggregates. So now you're wondering, so what? Well, many aging-related diseases are driven by protein aggregates like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. So if we can understand how proteins are made and what turns them into zombie proteins during aging, then we can think of ways not only to go back and find your keys, but we can hold on to our memories, to our creativity, and to our identity for a little bit longer. Thank you. So, Olga, what kind of is there any solutions coming forward about how we can combat um, these protein aggregates? Is that research ongoing, or where is that where is that in its state? Yeah, absolutely. So, there is a lot of research ongoing on this matter, and it's quite interesting because it depends on your point of view. So, if you are a clinician, you would like to test available drugs or um, antibodies, for example, or nanoparticles that can target the, the proteins that are misfolded in your brain. Um, but if you take a per perspective of a molecular biologist, then you want to know the basic fundamental ways that the protein is made and try to see why, what is the twist during aging that makes them go haywire. So there are many ways to tackle the same problem, and I think it's, and especially for neurodegenerative diseases, it's an elegant way to show that, um, yeah, whichever field you're from, a medical or a pharmaceutical or just a biologist, you can just uh, tackle from the different uh, sides of point of views. Yeah, cool. Um, I had a question about the ethics of, of this. If, we're all paying to potentially live longer. Mm -hmm. Is it right? You know, we, we use up so many resources on Earth at the moment. What do you, do you have a personal view on that? Absolutely. I, it is a bit difficult because this, we are prone to live longer, and that has obvious um, social economical in, um, consequences. But in a way, uh, there, but it is also true that as we live longer, the, the, the percentage of the population uh, that is prone to get these neurological diseases is much higher. So I would take a perspective of someone who, at the moment, there is no cure for these neurological diseases. But I would take a step back and think, how can we uh, provide healthy aging? How can we improve, or at least make the, 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 the lives of these patients less complicated and just ease their burden also for their caretakers? Yeah, yeah. great answer. Okay, long life good, zombies bad, Olga <laughs>
Oh, that's good. We like a bit of that. And despite only being seven letters, Olga Sin is an anagram of a losing. But will she be a losing Tremi finalist? Or will Olga Sin win her way through to the final? We will find out in seven Fame Labbers' time. So already we've had hairy balls, personalised medicine, misfolded proteins and a zombie apocalypse. And we've only had three Fame Labbers. Sophia, so good. Next, we head to the general area of Bulgaria. Uh, good to have them back in the competition. We've missed you. And their 2017 winner, Veronica Koleva. A final year chemistry student at Sofia University, Ronnie, as she's known, hails from Gabrovo, a small town at the foot of the Balkans, uh, which for reasons way too complicated to go into now, is known as the capital of laughter, with its own dedicated venue, the House of Humour and Satire. So I'm not sure whether Ronnie is joking when she says she takes her science very seriously, especially as she also mentions a predilection for pyromania and explosions and says that, quotes, she can make a real blast out of any festival. So funny ha-ha or funny peculiar, get ready to be blown away by Ronnie Koleva. <laughs> wanted to have superpowers. Then I started learning chemistry and people accuse me about blowing some stuff, etc. But this is not my theme. I'm going to talk about the superpowers that are hidden in one very small animal, the gecko. The geckos can walk above our heads and uh, run at any smooth surface without even falling. And why is that so? Let's say that we have some normal animal. Uh, we are all normal animals. So when we try to <laughs> stick on the wall, we actually fall from there. But what gecko does is actually uh, the secret is hidden in their toes. Their toes are specific and covered with small hair. Those hair increases the surface and make small electro uh, electromagnetic interactions that make them stick to the wall. Those interactions are called van der Waals forces and they are intermolecular interactions dependent on distance. Let's imagine that you're walking towards some, uh, somebody to the on the street. A step closer and you realize that he's a boy. One step closer, and you realize that he's quite handsome. And one step closer, and you realize that he's the guy who disturbs you in the, li uh, in the laboratory, so you run away and pretend it never happens. Actually, this happens between molecules. When they get closer to each other, uh, electromagnetic interaction increases but it can increase much than um, about 0.4 to 4 kilojoules per mole and they start to repel each other. The Kekos manages to keep that distance to the surface so he can stick. Uh, how it was discovered actually? The Gecko effect was discovered thanks to the atomic force microscope, which is very similar to the gramophone. Everyone has seen gramophone, maybe on the TV mainly, but uh, the IFM is working the same like the gramophone. The gramophone has a tip which circles around the surface and we have a sound. What IFM does actually gives us, uh, he repels from the surface and we have an image. So sticking a, seed, a hair from the gecko skin to the atomic force microscope, we will have a graph about with its peaks. Oops. <laughs> Tell us, uh, why gecko? Why do you choose these particular animals? Well, geckos are very interesting uh, because um, someone will say I'm a chemist and why uh, actually start talking about animals. Geckos have this incredible ability, which is uh, in the field of physical chemistry. So the van der Waals forces are really important and they are not only 
um, important for the Gekyu to stay on the wall. They're important in our lives. Okay. Um, how do you see uh, science communicating uh, fitting into your career, into your research? Is it an important part for you, or is it just something, uh, just a part of, of your work? Uh, science, science communication is a very important part of uh, every work of a scientist. It is uh, good for someone to manage, not like me, to talk for a really short time and um, to explain things very simply to the audience. Yeah, that's fascinating. I completely forgot about the time limit. I was just saying, ah, la di da, and I was like, just like you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm amazed that you guys managed to keep things to time. Anyway, my question. Um, what what is the secret to science communication for you? You've obviously been doing it while all of you guys have. What's the secret for you? What's the secret of science communication hmm. to me? Okay. Um, I haven't found it yet, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the secret. Maybe yeah. that's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> but, you enjoy, can I say, but, but you obviously enjoy science communicating. What is it about it that you really like? Uh, can you repeat, sorry? In s when you come here today, I mean, I love, we all love communicating science as much as you do. So what would you say is what you like most about talking about science to the public? What? What do you like most about doing these kind of things? Um, this is a complex question. I mean, uh, it's very lovely to have the opportunity to present something very easily and uh, finding uh, the moment when people understand you, it's amazing. It and I'm guessing the second thing you probably like is when the judges stop asking you questions <laughs> and, you can, and you can get off the stage, okay? <laughs> Whoa! Gecko and the funny woman, Ronnie Koleba. Right, next we'll head south a bit of Tur head south of Turkey, west of Syria, north of Egypt, southeast of Greece to Cyprus. Okay, I thought you'd see where we were. And our newly crowned Fame Lab 2017 winner, Monica Kirati. Except we can't, unfortunately. Maybe it's because she's originally from Kenya, we're not quite sure. Monica has had some visa issues, or rather non-issues, because she wasn't issued with a visa. So she can't make it. However, at incredibly short notice, and we are very grateful, the runner-up, Natalie Christopher, has come in her place. Very impressive. So a couple of days ago, had no idea was going to be taking part in FameLab International. Uh, so Natalie's an astronomer based at the European University of Cyprus in Nicosia and looking at big cosmic stuff like decomposing galaxies and supermassive black holes. She's also part of an Astronomy for Peace project working with school kids from both the Greek and Turkish Cypriot communities, getting them to come together in the neutral zone, as they call it, which sounds like something from Star Trek or early Tarkovsky films, and showing that we all live under the same sky together. Now, as I say, Natalie's here at very short notice. She only arrived at 2 a.m., but she's a triathlete, so she should have the stamina, stamina to survive a Tremi final. So, look who's here from Nicosia, and we're grateful for her, our Cypriot runner-up, Natalie Christopher. <laughs> Hello, can you see me? Can you can you see me? Well, no, of course you can't, because this this screen is blocking me. But what if I were to tell you? that under specific circumstances, and not via the use of magic, it is possible to see a background object, even if there's something blocking it in front. Now, in order to understand this, we need to understand how light is affected by gravity. 200 years ago, Newton thought that light was a particle. Now, we're very familiar with how everyday objects are affected by gravity. If we throw a ball up, it slows down, and then starts to travel back down towards Earth. So perhaps, if light is a particle, it's affected in the same way. Others thought that light was a wave, so they weren't quite sure how gravity affected it. Now, we know due to the kooky nature of quantum mechanics that light behaves both as a particle and as a wave. But even in the particle scenario, we also know that light has a set speed, so it can't slow down and speed up like the ball does. 
Now, this stumped scientists for years, and it wasn't until the early 1900s that our friend Einstein solved this conundrum. In his way of thinking, space is like a sheet, and if you place something with a mass on it, it curves the sheet or space around it. And it's actually the great mass of the sun which curves space around it, which causes the orbit of uh, planets around the sun. Now, instead of having just one star, imagine we have billions or trillions of stars, i.e. a galaxy, or even a cluster of galaxies altogether. Now, say we're looking at a distant galaxy, but there happens to be a cluster of galaxies in between the distant galaxy and us. So as the light from the distant galaxy travels towards us, it travels on the curved path caused by the huge mass of the cluster of galaxies, and we actually detect it. And depending on the orientation of the distant galaxy and the galaxy cluster, we may even see multiple images of this distant galaxy. If we're perfectly aligned, we see a beautiful ring of light from this distant galaxy. Now, aside from confirming the way that Einstein thought about gravity and giving us really beautiful and stunning images of the universe we live in, this concept of gravitational lensing, as it's called, is a really nifty tool for us astronomers because it allows us to observe distant galaxies, which intuitively we would think we can't see because they're blocked by other galaxies. Another cool feature of gravitational lensing is that the light from the distant galaxy may also be magnified. So this really allows us to observe galaxies which otherwise the emission would be extremely faint, galaxies from the early universe, and this helps us piece together how galaxies have evolved with time and how the universe looks the way it does. Thank you. Um, I've always wanted to ask a space expert this question, okay? Uh, do you think Hollywood does a good job of communicating your science? Sometimes. <laughs> What's the film? You know, not the, in the guy who directed Inception, and I've forgotten his film. So it's, help me. it's Interstellar, Interstellar, I think. Interstellar. Did you think Interstellar so did Kip a good job? Thorne, Kip Thorne is the scientist who did the science behind Interstellar. So if you haven't seen it, um, it talks about a black hole called Gargantua. And actually, in that film, the science is correct. So they employed him to do this. Well, actually, it was his idea to make this movie. And then with the help of the graphic designers, they then thought, OK, so the curvature of space around a black hole. So I was saying, in Einstein's theory, the more massive the object, the more curved space becomes. And in the case of a black hole, the space becomes so curved that nothing can travel fast enough to escape from it, not even light, hence the name black hole. So in the movie, they have the black hole. And in cases where you have material coming close enough to a black hole, so a nearby star or an inflow of gas, the material starts to swirl around the black hole and heat up and glow. So you have this so-called accretion disk around your black hole. But because of this effect of gravitational lensing, this warping of space around it, this is why you were seeing these really weird um, circles of light around the black hole. So actually, an interstellar gets it right. Other times I watch movies <laughs> and I just cringe and go, oh, for God's sake, this is so <laughs> wrong. And yeah. So interstellar is a good movie to watch. Cool. Either Star Wars or Star Trek at, at, oh. at this point. Just, uh, <laughs> just tell us. But well, actually, I don't watch either Star Wars or Ah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't mention. That's my confession, yeah. <laughs> but most scientists are surprised. It's a, it's a beautiful area, isn't it, astronomy? W what, what part of it fascinates you the most? What perplexes you the most in, in your own work? Yeah, astronomy is a really humbling science. So if you think about our place in the universe and how tiny our planet is, um, that really makes us, it fosters this sense of global citizenship. So I think it helps us understand that we need to be kinder to each other. The chances of life existing in this universe are so rare. Um, so really to preserve the only home that we've ever known mm. and also to be compassionate towards each other and, and live in peace and harmony, I think. Right. Thank right you now very remember, much. she didn't know she was going to be here a Thank couple of days ago. Much. She <laughs> arrived at 2 a.m. She did a presentation <laughs> about gravitational lensing and she answered questions about interstellar Star Wars and Star Trek. So <laughs> round of applause for Natalie <laughs> Christopher. Right now, as I mentioned, Cyprus is south, well, technically southeast of Greece, and it's Greece that is next up with their reigning champion, Polyzeni Spiliopoulou. Uh, Polyzeni is a bit of a polymath. She's got a degree in the School of Physical Education and Sports Science at Athens University, 
with specialisms in skiing and health. She's got another in Byzantine, or is it Byzantine music, and she's on her way to a diploma in playing the flute. Oh, and she also likes drawing with pencil and charcoal. No doubt Polizeni is multi-talented, but this is a multi-talent, multinational multitude she's up against, so will all her skills be enough to see her safe through to tomorrow's final? Beware of geeks being exceptionally gifted, unless they're 2017 Fame Lab Greece champion, Polizeni Spiliopoulou. <laughs> about allergies. But before that, I want to tell you a story. I won on a Facebook competition, and the award was free beers in a bar. When I arrived, there were ladies at the door to welcome me. Hello, what's your name, please? Polixenis Pilopoulou. I'm sorry, you're not on the list. I can't let you pass. But I've won the competition. I want to drink my beers. <laughs> and then, ladies made the sign, and two huge bodyguards appear. Hi, guys! Do you want a drink? Beers on me. Never mind. I'm still waiting for those beers. This is how our body works as well. When a substance comes to pass through our body, there are ladies, the macrophages, who check if the substance is good or bad. If it's good, they will let it pass through. If it's not, for example, like a virus that will make us sick, Ladies call the bodyguards, the antibodies, in order to eliminate it. In addition to that, memory lymphocytes come, take pictures of the virus, and share them to the whole body. So, in case the same virus reappears, it will be recognized and killed immediately. After a while, pictures come to an end. But if the same virus reappears, our body repeats the same process. If someone has allergies, the ladies of his body react like the ladies of the bar, who didn't allow me to enter, although I should have been on the list. For example, imagine that one day a good substance comes, for example, pollen, which normally should be allowed to enter the body, couldn't, because ladies got confused and called the bodyguards, the antibodies. In addition to that, Memory lymphocytes take so many pictures that will exist in the body for life. And whenever pollen comes around, the body reacts with coughing, sneezing, and itching. In order to prevent allergic reactions, we encourage future mothers to breastfeed their babies because breast milk contributes to the development of the immune system, which means that it helps ladies not to make mistakes. But even if someone is allergic, the thing he has to do is to avoid contact with it, for example, with pollen. To wrap it up, even if you become allergic one day in the future, do not worry. Except if you become allergic in beers, then you should worry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Why you made this subject, this, uh, why this idea? Well, uh, actually, I have a kind of allergy, but okay. I don't know what it is. Okay. I had a test of all allerg allergic reactions, but none of this is for me. So I looked for it, and I understand that it's not that you are allergic to these substances or not. You may be allergic to something else. It's just the wrong of your body. But you can't face it. Okay. So you you you, um, you do sketching and you're so you're quite artistic. What? Do you, you sketch as well? Yes. You do a lot of sketching? Yes, I like it. So do you think when you're drawing, your artistic mind yes. is similar to your scientific mind? Do you think they're they're the same or oh, different? Okay. These are two extremely different words. Yes. There are times that I'm on the one side and. I communicate with people in a very different world, and then I go to science, and they think very different. I've never tried to combine them. Can they be combined? Well, yeah. I should try. I mm -hmm. never think of it. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Mm -hmm. Yes. The way that people think, either from the one side or the other, are extremely different. I, absolutely. Okay. Yes. All right. mm -hmm. And with the field of allergy research, 
do we do we yet know properly why it seems to be increasing? Well, not yeah. even doctors knows why. It's like that uh, someone made the most powerful computer in the world, and he tries to turn it on, and it doesn't turn it on. So it's uh, why but it's it's perfect, <laughs> but you don't know why. Nobody yeah. knows why. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> So great allergy analogies there from Polly Zenis Miliopoulou. She did well with pollen, but will she do well with polling when the judges get to vote? Now, next, one of my really favourite experiences of 2017 was going to Johannesburg to do the South Africa Fame Lab Masterclass with 20 of their amazingly exuberant, ebullient, brilliant semi-finalists for their Fame Lab competition. I thought almost all of them were potential winners. And it would have been great if all of them could have been here. But actually, only one was and only one is. And that is Tsiamo Legoali. Now, Tsiamo is a geologist working in the platinum city of Rustenburg and helping local and marginalized communities to mine ore legally. She was involved in a whole series of fascinating projects from using lemon peel to make fertilizer to using cigarette butts to purify water to the one I think she's going to tell you about now. In her Twitter biography, she describes herself as a God-fearing, rock-loving, life-appreciating young woman building a life before becoming a wife. A huge helical welcome, please, for our FameLab South Africa 2017 winner, Tsiamo Legoali. <laughs> She's a gold digger, but she ain't me. Kanye, Kanye, Kanye. You should have just called me a gold digger. Because, well, that's what I am. Well, in actual fact, I'm a gold farmer. In South Africa, where I'm from, we have the big five. We had Utatu Nelson Mandela, may his soul rest in peace. But we also have an estimated 17.7 million tons of gold tailing stumps. Now, they create dust and take up space, but they also have residual amounts of gold. And much research goes into finding ways to extract this gold while keeping in line with the global sustainability goals. Those are environmental awareness, social responsibility, and economic growth. And today, I'm going to tell you about one such innovation, phytomining. Some plants are very picky eaters. When placed in soils, they'll pick out the one element or metal that they like the most, suck it up, and <coughs> store it in parts of their roots, stems, or branches. These are known as metal hyperaccumulators, and they do what I do. You see, I really like chocolate, but not just any kind. I like mine white. <laughs> and well, looking at me, it's pretty evident where all that chocolate is stored. <laughs> My study has revealed that wheat is one such gold hyperaccumulator. And I mean wheat, W-H-E-A-T, not what you thought I meant and got excited about. <laughs> you see, at a microscopic level, the root hairs of wheat resemble this sponge, and they have the ability to absorb and take up metals from the soil. But gold, in its natural form, is like this balloon. It cannot be absorbed because it is inert. This means that it is the introvert of the periodic table and does not like to form bonds and relationships with other metals or substances. But luckily, wheat has a trick up its tiny sleeve. It's able to release a composition of enzymes represented here by this toothpick. And this can then change the form of the gold into a soluble kind and thus able to absorb the gold. The wheat can then be harvested and burnt at extremely high temperatures to form a gold-bearing bio ore. And through smelting and um, liquid extraction, the gold can be removed. Now, we live in a world where 22,000 children die of hunger every day. I come of a, of a country where 27% of the population is unemployed. And through innovations such as phytomining, we could create jobs and put food on the tables. We could change the world. Thank you. So, um, 
So how did they discover this ability of, of wheat to absorb gold? Was it just by accident or how did it all begin, that research? Well, how it first started was by hyper, um, it was phytoremediation is how it started. Uh -huh. Certain plants were used to remediate polluted soils, but then later on it was called geobotany. So certain, plant, certain plants had um, an affinity to grow in certain soils. And for an example, the Bekea Kodi turned to grow in soils that were rich in copper, and they absorbed that copper. So that's where this study stemmed from. So in my country, the wheat turns to grow on its own in the Free State province, which are soils made out of the Vitz conglomerate that has gold. So all we had to do was take the wheat, plant it in dumps, and absorb some of the gold from there. So is, the, is, it like, is this a, painted, a patented thing? Is there a company that you know, controls the, the wheat that is you know, demonstrated there? Or is it, because the, the picture you paint is a really um, healthy socio enterprise. Is that the case? Well, at the moment, it's not patented yet because I work for um, a, a parastatal company. It's a parastatal research company. And we're still piloting the research. So at the moment, we're still using it on dumps, flattening them, and putting the wheat there. Also, other issues that must be considered are issues of space and recovery. So until those ones are ironed out, we can't really patent anything, as well as the species that we use. At the moment, we're using the durum species because of its resistance to the temperatures that we experience in South Africa, as well as a small need for water. However, the there have been proposals to genetically modify the type of weed to increase the, the yield that we get, to make it absorb more, or to increase the biosurface of the weed. So there's still a lot of research being done on the idea of phytomining. Okay, okay. hyper-accumulate some applause, please, for a South African winner, Siamo Legawale. And Siama Lagawali, anagram of Go Loathe Emails. Right, straight on to eight, and it's our Portuguese champion, David Badara. Now, as a child, David seemed destined to be one of two things, either a cartographer or a mathematician. By the age of two, he could identify over 50 countries on a world map. And he was also unusually good at arithmetic, winning a whole set and sequence of prizes, including a bronze medal in the Portuguese Math Olympics. But as he got older, something didn't quite add up. Other previously uncharted interests began to multiply. First came music, he learned to play the violin, and is now in a group playing songs inspired by traditional Portuguese fado music. Then came biochemistry, and a degree from the University of Coimbra. And now he's studying for a master's in oncology at the University of Porto, searching for molecules that might be early indicators of prostate cancer. So, what's next? He's not sure, although he's pretty confident about the next 180 seconds. Some applause, please, for our Portuguese from Portugal, David Bidara. <laughs> Charles Darwin proposed a controversial concept that radically changed the way we see ourselves. The concept of natural selection, which says that we are here today because our ancestors won the fight for survival. It was always a matter of fighting. Let's take an example, giraffes. Giraffes with long necks were able to reach the highest branches and obtain food. So they survive longer. And when they reproduce, this trait is passed on to their offspring while giraffes with short necks were constantly losing the fight and have progressively disappeared. We are the result of millions of years of evolution and natural selection. But here's a very curious thing. If we look at ourselves microscopically, at the cells we are made of, sometimes we see a cell that is stronger than the others, more able to grow and to obtain oxygen and nutrients that divides more rapidly and generates daughter cells with the same properties. But we don't call it evolution. We call it cancer. Why? Why is it that fight for survival between individuals is a good thing, but internally it can even kill us? OK, let's see the numbers. We have 100 trillion cells in our body, and most of them are constantly dividing. When a cell divides, all its DNA has to be copied. If each unit of DNA, which is called a nucleotide, is a letter, Copying the whole DNA is the same as copying the complete works of Shakespeare, 680 times. That's a lot. It's not easy to copy all this without making mistakes. And our cells make about 120,000 mistakes. 
which is a high number. Many of these mistakes can give the cell those abnormal growth advantages and form a cancer. We could even ask, so why don't we have cancer every day? Well, the fact is that our cells try really hard to stop this evolution process. First, they are able to read the DNA and to correct the mistakes they found. More than 99% of mistakes are corrected this way, but some of them may escape. It turns out that a cell that is created with errors and so potentially dangerous has the extraordinary capacity of committing suicide to avoid an abnormal growth. This phenomenon is called apoptosis, and it's always happening. Since I started this talk, more than 100 million of your cells have died from apoptosis. But let's think about all this. It was the fight for survival and natural selection that allowed us to be here today. But it's the sense of community and coexistence of cells that keeps us alive and healthy. So fighting for our own survival is not enough. We need to try really hard to fight this cancer cell evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. That was great. Um, what always interests me when I hear people like yourself speak really eloquently about cancer is we, in Britain, I don't know how it works worldwide, but in Britain we seem to do a lot of targeting different kinds of cancers. Mm -hmm. And we have various charities working on different kinds of lung cancer and so on. Um, are you saying we should be focusing on a, a cellular level obliterating cancer? In, you know, if we get one, if we understand cancer, do we stop all cancers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a cellular approach is important because the, the, the alterations that give rise to a cancer start at a single cell. And so by studying what happens within a cell, we can be able to predict cancer earlier and so to make earlier diagnosis and so treat uh, in advance and so avoid that a cancer uh, comes to very advanced stages and maybe kills the patient. Yeah, okay. To me, um, your next step in the science communication. Are you a musician? Are you going to play? <laughs> no, uh, musician is sorry, uh, it's just for fun. I mean, uh, I don't really pretend to have a, a career in, in music, yeah. but uh, you I can add music and uh, sure, yeah. yeah. And uh, what I most like about science communication is that I think science communication makes scientists better scientists because by trying to explain things in a simple way, they they really have to know that to know the things. Like uh, as Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So I think science communication is very important to to make good scientists. And you're, so you came into oncology from biochemistry. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that informs the way you see uh, your oncology differently to somebody who would have come at it from, from medicine? I think so, because uh, I don't see oncology as a clinic approach, but rather a molecular one. And yeah. so uh, how a cancer cell arises from a normal cell, because they are very different, but the cancer cell comes from the normal cell. What's happened? It's, it's very curious because there are not bad genes. I mean, the genes responsible for, for developing a cancer are the genes responsible for our growth. Yeah. And so they are not bad. They just need to be turned on wh while we are a child and then turn off forever. So. Okay, a prognosis on apoptosis and maybe <laughs> answers to cancer from our Portuguese champion, David Badara. Right. A hundred million of your cells have died of apoptosis just while he was giving that talk. That's another great takeaway fact. Now, num fame lover number nine is polished Polish paleobiologist Thomas Sule, an experienced finder of fossils worldwide. He's led expeditions to Greenland, to Tunisia, to Russia. He organizes ex excavations with students all over Europe, not for students, with students. And he's described all sorts of new species of Triassic reptiles and other creatures, on top of which Thomas also manages the Museum of Evolution at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. To slightly adapt a very old science joke, Thomas is the product of four billion years of evolutionary success. Now he gets three minutes to act like it. A huge hand for our FameLab Poland 2017 winner, Tomasz Sule. <laughs> Most of you know, our knowledge about ancient vertebrates is based mostly on study of their fossil bones. But several years ago, paleontologists started to study fossil excrements, coprolites. 
here I have such a coprolite, which we dug up in Poland a few years ago. It's 205 million years old. Fortunately, they lost their original smell and consistency. And to laymen, they look like a normal stone. But for us, they are a treasury of knowledge about extinct animals. For many years, paleontologists described mainly the shape of coprolites. But a few years ago, we started study what is inside them. For instance, this coprolite was left by large herbivorous mammal-like reptiles. My colleagues cut similar coprolites, and in section, they found a lot of small pieces of plants. It looks almost identical, like in modern hippo. It means that probably these mammal-like reptiles fed like these ma uh, mammals. So it means that they probably chose only the fresh green parts of plant and later digested them very long. The excrements provide very unique microenvironment, which is differs than their surroundings. That, led to, that allowed to preservation of very minute elements. For instance, in Russia, during expedition which I organized, we found coprolites, which are 260 million years old and had something special. Hair. The oldest hair in the world. It means that animals had hair so early. We suspect they were mammal-like reptiles. And the presence of hair suggests that they had fur. This fur was used to protect them from heat loss. So it means that they produce heat. Uh, it suggests that they were at least partly warm-blooded. Also that un undigested part of bones, which we found in that coprolite, suggest that this uh, reptiles had metabolism similar to modern mammals. The third aspect which you can study in coprolites is the morphology of very tiny elements. It is possible because CT scanning of coprolites becomes cheaper and resolution becomes higher. So in future, we will have 3D models of very tiny elements, and I'm sure that they give solution to many problems of paleontology. And thanks to that, we will better understand the nature, the history of life and nature around us, and we'll be able to protect it better. Thank you. Uh, you're speaking to a fellow coprolite panel. There's no conflict of interest here, but I'm a big fan of coprolites. So, <laughs> what, <laughs> it's a strange thing to say. What, um, were you a dinosaur-obsessed child? Has this come from that, and you're living the dream? What is your history as a dinosaur fan? Or no, a it, fan? it's very complicated. Uh, when I was a child, I was interested in dinosaurs, but later I uh, thought about being an uh, engineer, you know, constructor on, of yachts, I thought about being a sailor, so, uh, wow. but I studied biology, and during study biology, I come back to paleontology. Mm. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. And uh, what about your future uh, in uh, your research? I mean, uh, you're not studying exactly this stuff. I mean, what do you study, and uh, what is your next step after Finland? You know, I thought about um, looking for the the oldest bird, because when I, use, well, I was a participant in excavation in Kazakhstan, and we found only was protofeather, and only on, on, it's only one uh, specimen. So it will be great if we could find whole skeleton. And I thought about organized excavation to Kazakhstan uh, in cooperation with people from Kazakhstan to find whole skeleton of this animal. Um, as somebody who likes fossils but knows very little about them, what advice would you give to people who have little or no knowledge of fossils? Are they everywhere? Wh wh what can you see around us every day that would get us interested in but fossils? But do you think about small boys or...? Anybody. Uh, yeah, boy, me. Uh, pretend I'm a little boy. You can tell. <laughs> you know, because that's as much knowledge I, as, as I have, but I find it really interesting. So what, what advice would you give to people about the world around them uh, and finding fossils? Or s uh, 
my, adv my uh, advice is to, to go to the field yeah, and to looking for more fossils, you know? And I um, organized a club for young boys, and not only boys, um, uh, which <laughs> are interested in dinosaurs. And uh, after one year of working with them, I feel great success that they uh, went to forest and they found, you know, uh, white animals and they know how to observe it. And uh, they, that it, um, they don't only know, know a lot of uh, names of these dinosaurs, but they have contact with nature. Okay, okay you may find Neve applying to join your club. <laughs> Can we please thank Air Apparent, thanks thank to his you. research, our Poland champion, Tomasz Sule. Right, penultimately, by the way, I love the way that uh, Jules and Thomas were trying to bond over fossilised <laughs> excrement <laughs> there. Touch that fossil in his pocket. <laughs> That's okay. not a line you can say every day. No. Right, now, penultimately, we have our hometown boy, at least in the global terms of Fame Lab, and that is the UK champion, Alex Lathbridge. By day, Alex researches new ways to combat cancer as part of his biochemistry PhD at Bath University. By night, and sometimes by day as well, he's working in TV with programmes like Horizon and on stage as, some claim, the UK's best science rapper, using hip-hop to hold a mirror to imposter syndrome and making science easily digestible, accessible, impeccable, respectable. <coughs> I'll leave that sort of thing to Alex. Right, our FameLab UK winner, Alex Lathbridge. <laughs> I'm not really, I don't, I'm not going to have kids. Uh, what I'm saying is my girlfriend says I'm not going to have kids. I'm a man-child. That's my problem. And what I, I found recently looking at that is there's not a lot of options for guys, you know, to control contraception. It's always down to the women. And I often wondered why. Have there been massive advances in male contraceptive? Mm, there have, but it's a woman's game. You know, we've been talking about time. It's been 60 years of the female pill. I think we need uh, a male equivalent. You know, in a perfect world, what do we want? Enjoyment, but no sperm. Useful from day one, but reversible in the long term. Um, so let me bring it back, because we've got a couple of plans, but no one's really got it cracked. And we've got some game changes. We've got three, really, that are feasible. Hormonal, enzymatic, and then blocking it sort of physically. And what I've got here is, it's sort of, it's what I imagine the, it's a representation of the male organ. Um, the bullets represent the sperm, the chamber, the testes, and the size, my compensation mechanism. Now, Quentin, <laughs> if it actually looks like this, go see a urologist. Um, the issue, really, that you have is with women, you've got an egg, it's monthly, there's just one. Guys, you have about 15 million sperm per milliliter, so hormone usage is a bit more fun. So when it comes to uh, the hormone method, what we've tried in the male contraceptive pill is progesterone. In women, that can lead to uh, decreased, in, uh, decreased uh, inhibition of ovulation. And in men, similarly, it drops testosterone level, testosterone level, and that drops sperm production, which is great. But there are a couple of side effects, because in clinical trials, guys, they felt kind of depressed. So a little bit of testosterone, you've got to re-inject, and that method, it's not so perfect yet. But our next best bet is to target the sperm cell's head. We can shut down enzymes that would break down the egg's defense. So in the, in the head of the, the sperm, you've got the acrosome, and those contain enzymes that break down the outside of the egg. If we can target those and stop them from functioning, they can't break down the egg, which is great. And it, clinical trials have shown some promise. But there are side effects because that also targets an enzyme in the liver, meaning that when you take an alcohol, you get chronic, chronic pain. So yes, those are side effects, but unlike last time, it's a bit more direct. You take this, you take booze, you get pain, you vomit, because the drug goes into the liver and binds the wrong target. Now, lads, do not be sad, because there's one more method. It might make you glad. You know, when you get a vasectomy, you cut the vas deferens. This is a reversible method. It's going to make a vas deferens. You take this, you, you, uh, it's, uh, so what you can do is you inject this reversible polymer into the vas deferens, and it coats it. And by doing that, uh, it inactivates the sperm. They get weak and active. And after about a week, it's active. And that's really great. And so we've got three methods. None are perfect yet, but like a pedantic pervert, we're close to coming correct. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, the question is why? Why choose this topic, I mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> one, I mean, 
why not? Because like we live in a world, I'm, I'm going to like throw it out there, like we live in a world where people, even, okay, to use a silly example, Wonder Woman, a great film. Everyone thought that, oh, women shouldn't have that. Same thing, we should have that equality, that ability to choose. So I'm going to give a, a weird example, but not weird. Um, some people who are on drugs, for instance, um, okay. people who are, who are addicts, um, they should not have children, right? Um, and so what women will do is they'll go on the coil, of a long-term uh, contraception. And that's great because they can get clean and come back. It's about being able to make that choice. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. I think that's a really brilliant thing. What about, you know, the way it, it's great that, the, that you, know, you can suppress the activity of sperm in those three different ways. What, what about if you're in a situation and you want to then have children later yeah. in life? Is there, is there any sort of long-term effects for fertility for men. So with that third method, that reversible polymer that you can inject, it's meant to be reversible. So at the end, you can, uh, it, it's good for 10 years, and then you can inject this solvent, uh, DMSO, it's a wonderful solvent, and it should break it down. And that's great. Um, and it's just, what's really great about that is that it gives you that choice. It gives both parties in a relationship a choice. Um, the difficulty there is clinical trials, because you know, with women, clinical trials in sort of fertility you just have to monitor the egg development with these men. You have to, you have to get couples in. And oh, no, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 I see. It's a bit more, <laughs> it's a bit more complicated. Can I ask a really quick question about the, uh, in the bio, the intro wrapping? Yeah, no. Is this uh, an effective way of science communication, being creative like that? What's the response when you do it? Um, people like it, I hope. Um, <laughs> But I think what's really great is like when people have said that you can't mix art and science, and that's really silly, um, <laughs> because you can. Like it's and it's that ability to, like people have said, to break down a concept into s sort of these small things that you can manipulate them, put them to rhythm, put them to anything, and make them so simplistic that people can understand through beat and sort of poem. Great. I think the alternative answer, if Jules is asking you that, is you tell me. He's just, he's just seen you perform as you well. You tell me. You've just seen him perform. <laughs> yeah, he might tell you in a few minutes. Okay, contrapuntal contraception deserving an ovation for the ovulation. Yeah. Alex Lethbridge, the UK champion. That was the 30th and penultimate of all our fame labbers today. So, yes, having begun this shebang at 10 o'clock this morning, we are finally, or tremi finally, <laughs> onto our 31st International Fame Labber, and she is third year zoology student Yasmin Samir, our reigning Queen of the Nile, or to use her proper title, Fame Lab Egypt 2017 champion. For those of you who got the program, she was meant to be in the first heat, but because of flights, couldn't make it in time, so everything's been shifted to give her some small opportunity to recover, even though she's only just got in today. Now, as well as her studies at Alexandria University, Yasmin's keen to share academic and scientific insights with young people, or other young people. To do this, she's taken part in science festivities, showing experiments to school children, and worked in the academic committee member at the Model UN Security Council, which is like the UN Security Council, only for 12 to 16-year-olds. And now, she's targeting a slightly older audience. I suppose you could say FameLab is a bit like a kind of science UN, but for a slightly older audience. Please welcome our well-equipped Egypt champion, the last of our 31, Yasmin Samir. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And let me introduce to you a magic scientific technique. But first, meet little Johnny, a nine years old man who is sitting there in the first row. But he has his epileptic seizure, which stopped him from continuing. What is this? A seizure happens when a group of neurons in a certain brain area starting firing and being hyperactive, sending electrical charge in a very high rate in a very short time, which causes the seizure. If we could manipulate this hyperactivity and stop it, then we could solve the seizure. And that's what scientist Francis Crick proposed in 1999, and was a flame of a technique called optogenetics. To understand more this technique, we must study the nature of this algae, which mainly live in bond and become attractive to light because it has an organelle on its surface called eye spot. This eye spot 
absorb certain wavelengths and open the gates to allow the passage of charged particles in and out. It's mainly controlled by light. So we need our neurons to act in the presence of light like this algae. And to do so, we're going to steal the gene responsible for this character and give it to a secret agent that we hired and chosen by ourselves. And this secret agent is a certain type of viruses. But before we give him the gene, we must give him three strict commands. Do not cause diseases. Do not be caught by immune system. You must go and deliver the gene to selected neurons only without affecting other brain area. And then we will give him the gene and inject it to the brain. <coughs> and then we will see how the neurons will act after implanting an optic fiber. Scientists noticed two different things. Neurons will absorb blue light and then express a protein called channel reduction, which allows only positive charges in, and then the firing rate will be continued. Or it will absorb only orange light and express a protein called halorhodopsin, allowing negative charges in, and the firing rate will be stopped. By this technique, scientists could, uh, scientists could stop the seizure in a group of mice in an area called the cerebellum, which is responsible in, making the, and in controlling the contraction muscles in both animals and mice. Maybe after the widespread of clinical trials, Maybe our little Johnny could, con con could complete the whole show. Thank you. Um, Yasmin, do you, do you give that presentation to schools, or is that, is that a s one that you prepared uh, for us? I give it to my nephew. <laughs> you give it to your nephew. And what age, is, what age are they? Uh, like 11 and 6. And they, they understand, and they? Uh, they were just focused with little Johnny. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Very good. Okay. What have you learned about science communication working with children? Where? What have you learned about science ah, communication yeah, working with children? Yeah, in the Pipe Tech Alexandrina in the science festivity, we were allowed to make uh, like this show, but for school students. So we must deliver uh, the topic in a very short time, and we used only props and li someone like this. Yeah, they're good props. <laughs> And um, in your future, science communication will be a big part of research also will be... I didn't get it. So your, so the part of the science communication in your life uh -huh. uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future will be uh, a big part, or do you think? Uh, uh, I think the problem always and the boundary between anyone uh, work in the science field and the public <laughs> that we don't know, uh, we forgot the state of the unknowing. Like if we have a children and told him that 1 plus 1 equal 2 and he doesn't, doesn't get it, we just say it's 1 plus 1 equal 2, how you don't get it? We just forgot the, the state of the unknowing. When we reach this with our knowledge, then we can communicate in science. So I just want to continue as this way. And this, t talking about the research, at the moment it's at the, this is being done on mice, is it? So how yeah. far may we ha have to wait for human trials, maybe? Uh, human trials must be uh, applicable after making sure that implanting an optic fiber in the cranium, it's a dangerous thing. So you must study how to not being, uh, to like make an incision in, in the cranium, it's a dangerous. And making also wavelengths, like using blue light in a very high rate could, uh, you, uh, could cause burning to the cells. So you must make like a point mutation in the gene to make it more uh, excited in a very little amount of light. So all these uh, cases must be in, um, like calculated before getting into clinical trials. Okay, new light on neurons from Egypt's main emissary, <laughs> Yasmin Samir. Main emissary being an anagram, of course, of Yasmin Samir. Fine, right, that is it. That is the end of the line. Tronte Un, Tremi finalist 31. We have seen them all. If you've been here since 4.15, you'll have seen 11 bits of brilliance, 11 fame labulous fame labbers. If you've been here since 10, you'll have seen 31.
That's one a day, effectively, for a whole calendar month, but all crammed into one long session. So can we please give all 31, and particularly the 11 we've just seen, a huge ovation. <laughs> Judges, I hope you know what is now expected of you and the kind of people who meet those expectations. You have 10 minutes, 10 minutes only, three names from 11, yeah. make them the right names if possible. Make them people you've seen. We know it's very difficult. Can we have some applause, please, to send them on their way? Because they make them feel loved because they're going to soon feel hated. Jules Howard, Neve Shaw, Mattia Crivellini. And as those of you who have been here since the off will know, we've decided to give you 10 minutes just to cool down, relax, a literal, non-metaphoric 10 minutes. Stretch your legs. We've got some science-related music to play if you want to listen, or you can go out and come back in again. But we'll reconvene, if reconvening, in 10 minutes with the judges ready. Thank you. Right, thank you. The judges are back. They've reached a decision. This is good, we hope. Right. I'm just keen to get this resolved because according to an audience survey we did, over 90% of you have lives beyond this venue. So <laughs> we can't, for reasons of spectacle or load-bearing capacity, get the finalists back on the stage, but I think we should just give them one more name check and one more burst of applause. So can we please thank our Spaniard in the works, Pedro Pajares, <laughs> Thai guy, Perinha Kinnong Jock, <laughs> the original Olga Sin representing Germany, <laughs> from the Bulgarian capital of laughter, Ronnie Koleva, our substitute Cypriot, Natalie Christopher. Our chic Greek speaker, Polyzeni Spiliopoulou. <laughs> South African champion, Siamo Legoali. Former Portuguese bronze medalist, David Badara. Anti-penultimately, but in pole position, Thomas Sule. Last but one, UK champ, Alex Lathbridge. And finally, our Egyptian winner, Yasmin Samir. Now, judges, one of the weirdnesses of FameLab is yeah. that you're about to send through three of these 11 to tomorrow night's final. Mm. Tickets are £10 plus transaction fee. <laughs> and it will usually be jam-packed. But in my opinion, the standard today will be just as good as we get in the final tomorrow, uh -huh. which means eight really deserving people uh -huh. don't get to go through. Yeah. So... How have you done? I don't reveal the results yet, but how was it? And any other thoughts on... It's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. The standard is so high. And you I, know. I, you, I just, uh, w you know, wow to you guys, yeah, first of all. You know, absolutely unbelievable. But we've just genuinely been out there. We yeah. had a little yeah. sort of... It was weird. We had a sort of standoff. Yeah, like, we we were all just like, we don't know what to do. Yeah. And yeah. we will use a new word. Tough decision. Yeah. Tough <laughs> decision. <laughs> Very tough. Three tough decisions, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Any, just before you give those three tough decisions, any overview stuff on what you've seen? Uh, well, I mean, it, it just r all around, I mean, I loved, the, the, I loved the hair analogy at the start. I mean, if I, if I quickly, if I can quickly, if we quickly give kind of just very quick um, overall feedback, I think everybody was fantastic. There, there was something great in every single presentation that we saw. Pedro, I loved your hair. I don't think I'll ever look at hair the same again. I just... You know, all boyfriends, I'm going to look at that for future reference. Um, uh, <laughs> Perina, it's just a fabulous use of, of props, those like lovely medicine thing, and, and understanding uh, that medicine works for different people was really clearly explained. Um, and uh, Olga, uh, super, absolutely super um, zombie costume, and I really understand, we all understood the aggregate pro of proteins. The passion came across, the passion came across in everybody. Um, and then we had a, a lovely gecko, and we were told about Van der Waals forces, um, and, and a fabulous commitment there to science communicating as well. Um, then we learned about how wheat can actually extract gold, in, and uh, again, a lovely um, analogy and, and great spirit and uh, thought put into it. Um, and then David took us through uh, natural selection, um, and his uh, definitely his background in biochemistry certainly informs his oncology in a unique way. Um, and then uh, Natalie, at short notice, came to us and gave a fantastic presentation about astronomy and, and her understanding of the universe. I mean, it's incredible to pull that together from 2 a.m. in the morning. 
And, and then we had a, a fabulous talk about antibiotic, antibodies and beautiful passion uh, from po polyxemia, excuse the, if I haven't pronounced that properly, and uh, fossils. I was given a, a 101 class in fossils and, uh, and a, an obvious avid fan there. And, and please continue in your, in your discovery of, of fossils. Um, I'll certainly be keeping an, an, an eye on it. And then Alex uh, told us all about uh, contraception and his uh, beautiful rap style, a very unique way of communicating and definitely combining science and the arts. And then, and then lastly, we had that um, presentation on epilepsy and beautiful use of props and, and somebody who uh, is going into schools and trying to inspire the next generation of science in new and interesting ways. So every single one of them are deserving to be Brilliant. quite and really nice things about that. Nice yeah. one for everybody. Yeah. Right. Anything to add, or do you want to get straight to wielding the knife? We can go. Well, I was just going to very quickly just say to, to do this as well in a second or third language is unbelievable. Yeah. Honestly, I'm absolutely gobsmacked. I mean, it's hard enough in your first language. So, again, you know, amazing work. Really, really Super. good. Keep pushing with science com communication, guys. You do uh, an awesome job, and uh, we need we need our planet needs new people, young people, young researchers. That now uh, more than ever. Yeah. Some now might more than say. ever. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So don't stop it. Anyway, will be the final result. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Even don't let this defeat that most of you are about to suffer set you back. <laughs> is what Matt is saying. Right. Let's get to it. How are you going to do it? Should we do one each? Do one yeah, each, one yeah. Each. Do one each. Like if we start this These are all nothing. equal, but obviously we're not speaking three people at once. Jules, you can okay. go first. <laughs> we ready? I feel like it should be a drum roll. Um, Come on stage okay. when your name is called. Okay. So uh, our, our first winner uh, today is uh, Sashiamo Legioli. Siamo. Oh, sorry. Siamo oh. Legioli. Sorry. <laughs> Well done. I think it was the master class that swung it. Right, yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Nepotism. Um, right. uh, our next winner today is David from Portugal. <laughs> well, Last but not least. Yes, they're all equal. Yeah, we'll enter in the final. Alex, Ledbridge, United Kingdom. <laughs> Whoa. Well done. So that is it. If I've got this right, we now know our finalists are in alphabetical order from Australia, Hong Kong, India, Malta, Mauritius, Portugal, South Africa, Uganda, and the UK. I think that is right. So congratulations to all those chosen. Commiserations to those who now have to get out and hang out at the Cheltenham Science Festival, enjoy the free food and drink and the shows, and not have to worry about doing something tomorrow night. Actually, you know, it's not so bad not winning, is it, when you, when you really think it through? But can we please also thank our judges, Mattia Crivellini, Neve Shaw, and Jules Howard. Right, thank you again for coming, particularly those who've been here for the long shift since 10 a.m. It's just been the mere eight hours since we started as well. Thanks to the backstage team, thanks to everybody else. But please, applause for all our finalists and for all our Tremi finalists as well. And I'll see some of you at the grand final tomorrow. <laughs>